Det här är en intervju mellan Alexandra på Livsenergi och Dr. Steven Gundry som är aktuell i Sverige med boken Livslängdsparadoxen. Steven Gundry är hjärtspecialisten och prisbelönta kirurgen som sadlade om när han insåg att människor kan må bättre och undvika operationer med rätt kost och livsstil. I sin senaste bok berättar han om hur vi kan förlänga livet. Hello, Dr. Gundry. Welcome to Lips Energy. Thanks very much. And good to see you again. Yeah, it's been a while, but not too long. We met shortly in June, and it was really lovely to see you here in Stockholm. And it was great being in Stockholm, and uh, hope to return soon. So do we. <laughs> but perhaps not in the winter. <laughs> No, actually today we had the first uh, uh, snow falling, very, very, um, how do you say, shallow, very few, but still it was uh, a bit of snow here in, in Stockholm, cold. <laughs> so, um, I'm just going to introduce you a little bit because uh, most of our members in Lips Energy, they know you already because last year we launched the book, The Planned Paradox. But we didn't have the chance to meet you then because you're a busy man. And we're gonna talk a little bit about your efficiency because I, I believe that you are very efficient. Yeah, we have a cat here with us today. <laughs> so you are Dr. Stephen Gundry. And you are a heart surgeon, you are a cardiologist, innovator, innovator, and author of several books, right? Correct. So, um, a lot of our members and readers really appreciate the, the planned paradox. And now you, we are up for the launch of your next book called The Long Evity Paradox. What can you tell us about that one shortly? Sure. Longevity paradox came about with what I learned um, researching the plant paradox and caring for a large number of patients in my practice uh, who are super old people. Um, Palm Springs, California is uh, sometimes called God's waiting room. Uh, because we do have a, a large number of super old individuals who are actually doing well. And I have multiple patients uh, over years of age who are doing well. And I personally spent most of my career as a professor at Loma Linda, California, which is the only blue zone in, in the United States. And blue zones were defined by Dan Bruckner a journalist as places in the world with exceptional longevity. And so I used my knowledge from Melinda and from patients um, to look at the factors that go into um, longevity. And the reason it's called the longevity paradox is uh, most of us want to live a long time, but we just don't want to get old. And that's the paradox. And so <laughs> the, the subtitle is how to die young at a ripe old age, because that's actually what we would all like to do and it seems impossible. And the more we kind of look down the road and see what happens to our, even our contemporaries, they're, you know, they're having stents and bypass surgery and they have diabetes and they have a knee replacement or a hip replacement and they're becoming forgetful. And we see this huge population in the United States uh, beginning to live in assisting or nursing homes. And for most of us, that isn't what we're hoping for. Very true. So how can we change this, you think? Well, the exciting part of this book is uh, we now are beginning to understand, and the research is incredibly strong, that our fate and our youth is actually tied into the type and mix of bacteria that live inside of our uh, intestines. And as strange as it may 
seem with the human microbiome project, we now know that there are at least a hundred trillion bacteria that live inside of us, uh, in our mouths, on our skin, and even a cloud uh, around us. Mm -hmm. And it's the type of these bacteria and compounds that these bacteria make and their relationship with the wall of our intestines that uh, now unequivocally is proven to determine how fast or slow we're going to age. The book is a guide on how you can actually foster the type of microbiome that is going to keep you young and keep you around for a very long time. To make people think that we're, we're basically a condominium for bacteria and we're their home. And if we give them the things that they want to eat, they will actually keep their home pristine. They'll clean it up, they'll you know, paint the walls, they'll do the repair work. But if we, there's a separate set of bacteria that I call gang members mm -hmm. that have no interest in taking care of us. They would rather throw rocks through our windows. They'd, they'd be uh, taking to the streets and gun battles. And they actually love different kind of foods. And the foods they love, sadly, are the, what we now call the SAD diet, the standard American diet, which is mostly refined carbohydrates, sugars, and lots of saturated fats. And that's a recipe uh, for bad bacteria and a recipe for all the bad things that we see as inevitable uh, with aging. And it's not at all. So it's good news that we can actually um, influence our bacteria in our guts. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's really empowering news because we're not, not just, you know, kind of standing by, you know, aging, watching aging process. And this can happen at, at any time. Um, I preview even a, a 102 year old woman uh, in the book. We actually finish with her who had horrible crippling rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she's actually a phenomenal woman. She actually at, at 102 teaches chair yoga, uh, which, is <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, but at 102, she uh, adopted my diet. And she, there are markers for rheumatoid arthritis that we can measure blood tests. And I've known her now for 10 years, and I finally convinced her to try this at 102. She, her markers of rheumatoid arthritis uh, completely abolished in six months. And what was so exciting, and uh, I'll give a punchline to the book, she's, uh, she's a rather funny young lady, and she had such gnarled fingers that her knuckles were just huge, and she wore a lot of rings. And she couldn't off because of her knuckles. And so when I saw her um, after six months, she, she turned her hands down towards the floor, and she said, I'm really mad at you because uh, I can't keep my rings on. And all her rings fell off because her knuckles uh, had shrunk at 102. And, you know, these are things that we can't conceive that, you know, arthritis could go away. And yet I have people cancel hip and knee replacements because they regrow cartilage. And, uh, I mean, and this is it's actually really empowering to know that simple steps that you can take, particularly in the choices of foods that you make, um, will energize the good guys, your gut buddies, and they'll start cleaning up the place. So thank you for that explanation. And I can't wait actually to get into the longevity um, program. I have followed the Plant Paradox program and my mom is now following it very um, 
like it, to to the <laughs> to the details. And she loves tea. <laughs> yes, and it's uh, it's great. Uh, you feel so well and healthy. Um, what would you say, like in in a few sentences, are the differences between the books? Because our members, they bought a lot of them bought the book, you know, in the book club last year, the Plant Paradox. And now we're going to launch the longevity. So what would be the, the, the big difference between, because they're so unlike each other to me, but ju just tell us a little bit about the differences. Well, I think the differences is in the plant paradox, uh, you know, my primary focus was to hopefully convince people that there are certain plants that don't want to be eaten actually harm our health. And I, I certainly uh, reintroduce the concept that lectins are mischievous. In fact, uh, since the plant paradox was published, uh, I've now published two papers that um, I think uh, show that lectins are a major cause of uh, hardening of the arteries, of coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. And that by removing major lectins from humans' diets, we can actually show regression of, a t of an immune attack lining of our arteries by specialized tests, pulse score. And again, I think the more we learn about how certain plants don't like us, uh, the more we're empowered to say getting coronary artery disease and having a stent or a stroke or bypass isn't necessarily going to happen to me. So th that's one thing. But more importantly, uh, I spend quite a bit of time looking at what are the, the common f features of people in the blue zones. And they're really not uh, what... Um, like Dan Buckner is trying to convince people. Um, to kind of bl briefly summarize, uh, Dan Buckner would suggest that all the uh, eat lots of beans and whole grains, and that's why they live so long. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, that's not a common factor of all the blue zones. Um, for instance, the Okinawans uh, in Japan uh, eat no beans, uh, they eat almost no rice, and the rice they eat is actually white rice, not whole grain rice, and they, 85% of their diet is a purple sweet potato. And I get into the fact that, believe it or not, a purple sweet potato is one of the best things that you could feed your gut buddies, and that explains why they do so well. Three of the areas of the blue zones consume a liter of olive oil per week. Mm -hmm. And that's about 10 tablespoons a day. Uh, and we know now from research in Spain that you can take 65 year old people and put them on a Mediterranean diet, uh, Spain obviously. Uh, one group has to use a liter of olive oil per week. The other group uses a low fat diet and we follow them for five years. And at the end of five years, the olive oil group has improved memory at age 70 versus what they had at age 65, which is great news. They have less coronary artery disease and women have a 76% redu reduced risk of breast cancer compared to the low fat group who has worse memory, more coronary artery disease and more incidence of breast cancer. So if three of the blue zones are using a liter of olive oil per week, uh, one of my favorite sayings is the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. <laughs> and that's very true. You know, uh, I love oil, olive oil. Could I, um, do you think I could um, eat or drink or whatever you do, digest uh, a liter of olive oil with good conscience? like just like that, or do I have to have the rest of the stuff? Uh, well, yeah, no, actually it's, it's interesting. Um, 
there's really good studies that the more olive oil you consume, the more weight you lose, which really, you know, is mind blowing because most of us have been taught that, you know, calories in, calories out, and that we, you know, we have to restrict calories to lose weight. And in fact, that's absolutely not true. The the second law of thermodynamics, which is all this is based on, never accounted for the fact that we have bacteria in our gut that can actually eat the food that we swallow. Mm -hmm. And there, what's really exciting that we talk about in the book is that there are certain bacteria that are called obesogenic bacteria mm -hmm. that extract calories aggressively from the food we eat and pass it into us. Mm -hmm. And there are other bacteria that keep it all from themselves mm -hmm. and just have any. And that's why you can actually have two people that appear to eat the exact same amount of calories and one of them skinny and the other one, you know, is, is blown up like a typical American. It's actually because of the bacteria in their gut. So that's, that's yeah, so olive oil is great for you. The, the third thing I think that's very important is I was actually one of the original uh, physicians to make a case for intermittent fasting or what we call time-restricted feeding back in the early 2000s. And interesting, I, I had a my first book was called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, which was published in 2007. And in that book, originally, I had an entire chapter on time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. And my editor, uh, in the final edit, said, you know, this is crazy. You know, you're already crazy, and you're making all these crazy, you know, pr things. And people are just not, because I was actually, during the winter, which I still do now, I was eating all my calories in a two hour window from six to eight o'clock at night. So that 22 out of 24 hours, I was fasting for six months. Oh. And, and she said, that, that is nuts. I mean, you know, that's crazy. And I'm going to cut this chapter. I said, no, 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 don't, you know, this is real. This is based on science. This is based, you know, on my work. And she said, okay, I'll give you two pages and that's all you get. And so it's, she in subsequent years, when the 5-2 diet came out, when intermittent fasting became recognized as a very powerful tool for anti-aging and improving health, she would write me or call me up. She says, ah, you know, oh, you were right. I let you have that whole chapter. I should, I should have known. And so. Yeah. That's funny. I have the uh, evidence. That. Yeah, I, I, I understand that because I have evidence around me how um, intermittent fast and, and so on works very well on me and my relatives and stuff like that. So, yes. yeah. The other thing I think that uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, who's become a friend of mine through the years, uh, and he actually uses my uh, program in his clinic in uh, taking care of uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he makes a very strong case that mm -hmm. we, we should all go a minimum of 14 hours every day without eating. And that's in a way much easier than it sounds because seven to eight of those hours you're asleep. Um, and, and he makes, I think, a even stronger case that the longer we can extend this, 16 hours, maybe 20 hours, the better we're going to do. And I think all of us working in this field are, are trying to convince people, actually all over the world, that breakfast is, is the least important meal of the day. And uh, we, uh, particularly in the United States, through advertising by cereal companies, we've become convinced that you have to have you know, breakfast. Mm -hmm. But we forget that the origin of the English word breakfast was break fast. And, and I try to remind everyone, our, 
our ancestors uh, really never had breakfast because they didn't crawl out of their cave and say, what's for breakfast? Because there wasn't any breakfast. There was no storage system. There were no refrigerators. There were no pantries. And to get breakfast, to break our fast, we would have to find food. And when we found food, that might be lunch when we broke our fast. Uh, it might be dinner. It might be two days from now. And so one of the unique qualities that allowed humans to take over the world like locusts was our ability to go extended periods of time uh, without eating or without eating very much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to all remember that all great religions uh, have fasting as, as a part of their practice. And the more you know, I and others look into this practice, it wasn't for people to practice sacrifice. It was actually a health-promoting tool. And uh, I think, I mean, every, you name, you know, a great philosophy or religion, and you'll find fasting as a part of that practice. Yeah, definitely. So we're already uh, scratching the surface on this one. But, uh, you know, uh, before people in Sweden will read this book, it would be nice to hear a few tips from you. Uh, what do you think we should start doing and what do you think we should stop doing uh, in order for us to take the first steps into the longevity health lifestyle? Well, I think, you know, I think Sweden uh, is actually ahead of things in, in a lot of areas, particularly uh, there are uh, proponents in Sweden of dramatically uh, limiting um, refined carbohydrates and high carbohydrate meals. Uh, Sweden luckily has a, a treasure trove of uh, deep water fish that have large amounts of omega-3 fats. And just to stay on that subject for a moment, there's a the way we test for the amount of omega-3 fats in the important omega-3 fats in our body called the omega-3, which <coughs> looks at that, how much omega-3 fats we have for two months uh, before the test in us. And so people who have the highest omega-3 index as they age have the biggest brains and the biggest areas of memory, the hippocampus. And people who have the lowest uh, omega-3 index have the most shrunken brains and the smallest areas of memory. And what we're beginning to realize is that uh, our brain is about 60% fat. And half of the fat in our brain is an omega-3 fat called DHA, which is uh, incredibly common in, for instance, salmon or other deep water fish. And the more DHA in our diet, the bigger our brains. And so who wouldn't want a bigger brain? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, I think Sweden has done a really good job in trying to convince people that simple carbohydrates are, are really not our friend. Uh, I go certainly beyond that. Grains in general uh, are loaded with lectins and my humble opinion have very little place in, in a modern diet. On the other hand, there are types of vegetables that I think are incredibly useful, and we make the case for them in the longevity paradox. And it gets, it gets kind of fun, sciencey, nerdy in a way, but there are bacteria in the line, that live in a mucus layer that lines our gut. And this mucus layer really determines how healthy we're going to be. And this particular bug is called Ackermansia mucinophilia. It means okay. mucus loving. <laughs> yeah. And so fasting, it turns out, uh, this bug can survive living on the, in our gut. 
uh, even if we're not eating. And the more it eats mucus, it, the more it actually stimulates our gut cells to make more mucus. And the more mucus we have, the healthier our bodies are. Now, er, Acromancia loves a type of sugar that we can't digest, and it's called inulin. And inulin is very prevalent in vegetables of the chicory family. So this is Belgian endive, chicory, frisee, uh, radicchio, uh, treviso. It's also very common in sunchokes or what are called Jerusalem artichokes. Mm -hmm. It's very common in, uh, in actually some avocado, but mostly artichokes. And if you actually look at the Mediterranean diet, um, wherever I go in Italy and the south of France, there are chicory vegetables in almost every salad that I've ever been served. And I think these folks didn't know why they should be eating them. But when you know so many of the blue zones cluster in the Mediterranean and you look at these foods that they're eating, mm -hmm. You go, oh, um, they're healthy because they're actually feeding the bacteria that we need to be healthy exactly what they want to eat. Um, so one of the points of the book is, is we need to find that we need to eat for our gut bacteria. And if we eat for them, uh, they're going to take care of their home. And, you know, that's, and it tastes good. It tastes good. Thank you for that. <laughs> At least we can have something to look forward to. Yeah, we, do, we don't have to eat twigs and bark uh, to live a long time. <laughs> but how can we then um, uh, justify that Italians still eat pasta? So interestingly enough, um, the Italians view pasta as a way of getting olive oil and vegetables into their mouth. Uh, pasta means paste, and that's all it is. It's paste. And they aren't eating whole wheat pasta. Uh, they're eating refined pasta, which if, and they cook, cook it al dente, that means to the tooth. So they undercook it so that it actually can't be digested quickly. So properly cooked pasta, has a, actually a low glycemic index, but the purpose of the pasta is to get olive oil and vegetables into their mouth. Uh, and that's kind of, and the other thing, I've just returned from Italy of visiting some bombic vineyards in Tuscany and meeting with chefs and winemakers. And all of these folks have gorgeous organic gardens uh, as part of their properties and we'd be walking through the gardens and they have big uh, Roma tomatoes. The, um, and I said, oh, you know, um, I see you have tomatoes. They say, oh yeah, we use it, you know, for tomato sauce. And I said, well, how do you make sauce is my, one of my trick questions. And they <laughs> said, well, we peel the tomato and then we take the seeds out and we use the pulp to make sauce. And I said, well, why do you peel and de-seed them? And they said, what do you mean? Uh, everyone knows you, you can't eat the peel and seeds of tomatoes. They're poisonous. And I said, well, how does everybody know this? And they said, well, you know, my mother taught, my mother's mother taught her, and everybody knows this. And I have yet to meet a chef in Italy that doesn't tell me that you have to peel and de-seed a tomato to make tomato sauce. And it's true, those, that's where the lectins are. Exactly, that's what I read in your plant paradox. But I wonder if most people know this. No, mm. no, they don't. Because one of the things that I do talk about in the longevity paradox is we've, we've lost this generational that used to occur normally because nuclear families uh, contain, you know, children, the parents, the grandparents, and, and often the great-grandparents, either all within a single house or certain uh, contained in the houses next 
next door. Um, even myself, uh, I had my great grandparents lived very near. I, I visited my great grandparents really constantly during my young years. My, my grandmother um, died one month shy of her 100th birthday, but I have two great aunts and uncles who 105 and 106. And I was constantly uh, at their homes. And one thing I mention in the book is my great grandmother. Her bedroom was on the third story of her house. And even until the day she died, she kept her bedroom on the third floor of her house. And she walked up and down those stairs multiple times a day. My sister and I, you know, thought, boy, you know, great grandma is really dumb. Um, why don't you bring your bedroom, you know, down to the first floor? Well, she was really smart. Uh, because one of the features of most blue zone communities is they live in hilly communities and they walk up and down hills. Um, Loma Linda, the name in Spanish means beautiful hill, and it's a, it's a hilly community. And all the blue zones live in hilly communities. So um, walk up and down hills is actually one of the secrets to a great old age. And something that you mentioned about the longevity um, lifestyle, so to say, is that we have to, to change the perspective of uh, how, how we're aging. Yeah. Um, one of the things that blue zoners do, and super old people, is they surround themselves uh, with young people. And they, uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. One of the, I think one of the purposes of, of getting old um, is to impart wisdom to uh, people coming up behind. And again, we've, we've lost that feature that it's so common in super old communities that the, the old people actually believe that it's their purpose to to some and you know give the benefit of the wisdom and, you know the old expression youth is wasted on the young uh, is is rather true mm -hmm. and uh, I think the more uh, we interact with old people uh, the better the other thing that I think is very important for people to realize and I see this in my practice. Once people retire, it starts a downward spiral. And there was a study published out of China uh, today showing that um, once people retire, their health re declines rapidly. And I tell people, never retire. Uh, <laughs> even if you decide to stop one career, um, start another one. Uh, the, the whole idea of being mentally engaged, number one, and engaged in a social community. Uh, this was particularly true before our current generation of men, where really their only social interaction was, was a job at work. And uh, now, uh, both men and women have this important social interaction interaction occurs on the job and that solution is also a real key to longevity and if for no other reason that I talk about in the book we exchange bacteria constantly and the more mix of different bacteria uh, the healthier you are going forward and that's why one of the things I tell everyone is to get a dog or a cat. Uh, and because a dog particularly, or if it's an outdoor cat, will always bring in new bacteria into the home and give you a nice lick on the face and will seed you with whatever he's found out in, in the wild. Uh, and believe it or not, people who have dogs live longer people who have cats live longer. People who have dogs with young children 
the children have far less asthma and allergies and eczema than people who don't have dogs. We, we talk a little bit about your life here because uh, before we started the recording here, you told me that you, you rose early in the morning about like just after four o'clock, right? 420. 420. Yep. And that's something you do every day. Yeah. Um, so the other interesting factor is you should very, very consistent about uh, bedtime and rising. And you should do this uh, as a routine. The idea that you should sleep in on weekends actually has been disproven as a useful tool. Uh, what I tend to do is uh, follow my dogs. Uh, and my dogs basically kind of I'll look at the clock at about eight o'clock at night and you know they look at you like okay come on it's time to go to bed and then uh we got into the habit we had a little yorkshire terrier um who at about 4 20 in the morning she would sleep on our bed and at 4 20 she would pounce on my chest and start literally growling and spitting in my face um <laughs> and you know my my reaction would normally be to you know grab her and throw her against the wall no i <laughs> but that, I know you're was, a dog lover. <laughs> she, she, she was the alarm clock. So, you know, come on. And, you know, luckily, I think dogs and cats are in touch with, you know, these primal forces of nature mm -hmm. that we've long since uh, made ourselves immune and not being able to sense. And I think the more we can work in rhythms of nature, uh, the better off we are. And you know, study after study shows the more time we spend in a forested environment or a green environment, even if it's 20 minutes a day, the positive health effects uh, of that are, are really undeniable. Uh, I mean, good scientific studies. So get in a routine and just stay in that routine. And um, the, you know, the other thing, if I could try to get people to skip breakfast, it would be, it would be a wonderful thing. It doesn't no, mean you can't ever have it. I love the green smoothie that you have in the Plant Paradox. I yeah. do it uh, kind of every morning. And I stay on that until lunch and it's uh, fantastic. Uh, it, it nourishes my body in a, in a well sufficient way. Yeah, that's been actually one of the the big winners around the world. That green green smoothie yeah. and uh, yeah, and it really it really does you know stay with you. Uh, people people are surprised that it's actually these uh, high simple sugar carbohydrate meals like a muffin or a Danish or a pastry that that gives your blood sugar a big spike and then you crash and you know 10 o'clock in the morning you're you're starving and your brain doesn't work properly. uh but that's you know not 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 normal uh so we're far better off doing something like a green smoothie and people don't realize it but the reason i invented that was you're i'm feeding your bugs and they'll feed you um exactly i have to i i know that you have a busy day today and we're about uh, time here but i i have to ask you still because i mean with the impressive background that you have you have uh, accomplishments in your life that people would dream of and i mean you have been rated one of the top 20 uh, doctors or heart surgeons in the united states for over 20 years yeah. which is kind of amazing to me and still you i mean you are in your next career here your second career what we would say yeah. and you have uh, um, you're over 70 years old actually i'm 69 i'll be 70 this coming year i'm so sorry <laughs> it, well no that's okay it's interesting on the internet 
Uh, it says, or, and we've tried to get Google to change that. And they said, no, and I, we, we even sent my birth certificate in. So I, I guess I, I feel like President Obama that maybe. You know, so. <laughs> That's fun. But, yeah, so I, I think it's great if people think I'm 74, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'll turn 70 this coming year. Uh, Still, you look amazing. I met you in person. You look amazing. You're healthy. I know that hasn't been the case for your entire correct. life. Right. And, yeah, and I think that's really important. Uh, you know, I was 70 pounds overweight uh, as a very famous heart surgeon, despite running 30 miles a week and going to the gym one hour a day and eating a healthy, low-fat diet, and I had arthritis, and high blood pressure, and prediabetes, and I had migraine headaches, um, and I was told cholesterol, and I was told that this was genetics, because my father was the same way, and lo and behold, it had nothing to do with genetics, and that's actually how the longevity paradox work, starts, uh, and this is, I think, really important. Genes, your genes contribute only 8% statistically to your fate. And about 92, 94% of everything that's going to happen to you is from the food you eat and the environment you live in. And only, you know, 8% is genetic. And so it's what we tell our genes uh, that's really going to make the difference with the food we eat and the environment we live in. And it, that's so empowering that how, you know, people say, oh, you know, my, my father died of a heart attack or my mother had cancer or, you know, my mother, my sister has diabetes. So that's, that's my fate. It's, it's not your fate. I, you know, I have none of the things that I used to have. Uh, I don't have arthritis anymore. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have prediabetes. I don't have migraine headaches. They're gone. Let me give you another great example. Um, I have uh, a female patient and her husband from San Francisco. Uh, she's 45 years old. She uh, had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, low thyroid. Uh, she had lupus, uh, another autoimmune disease. She had another autoimmune disease, Sjogren's syndrome, which is dry eyes, dry mouth. And she was told by her doctors that she would always have Hashimoto's and, and these diseases. Well, we've worked with her for six months now, and I actually just got off the phone with her last night, my last visit of the night. and we reviewed her lab, newest lab work, and she no longer has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She no longer has markers for lupus. She no longer has markers for Sjogren's syndrome. They're gone, they're turned off. And, you know, she's basically in tears. And she said, but, but this is impossible. You know, all my doctors told me that I would always have this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not true. Um, we have the ability to change our fate uh, no matter when we start this process. And that's, uh, and that's the longevity paradox. It's never, ever too late to, to start this, whether you're, whether you're eight years old with disease or 88 years old or 102 with rheumatoid arthritis. It is never too late. We have such an amazing ability to repair and restore ours. And this was actually described by Hippocrates 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. he, he believed that we all, all creatures had what, what he called, translated from Greek, the green life force energy. Mm -hmm. And that actually sounds very Swedish. Um, people, doesn't it? Uh, it sounds very Swedish. Uh, that we we have the desire and ability to have perfect health. And Hippocrates said there are external forces, external factors that are key keeping us from this green life force energy expressed. And a physician's job is to act like a detective and find out what is the external factors that are stopping this and removing them, teaching the patient to remove them. And then the patient's green life force energy will heal 
itself. Yeah. And over the last 20 years, uh, what I've learned um, is uh, that Hippocrates was right. And all I do is I'm just a detective. And so it, it's never too late. Is, the funny thing is that you have this fantastic career behind you, and then you, you kind of switch from, oh, yeah. if you say so, the surgery knife to yep. diet and lifestyle habits. What convinced you to do that shift? Well, I talk about this gentleman in, in all my books uh, who I call Big Ed. Uh, Big Ed was a very obese individual with inoperable coronary arteries. These always were clogged and you couldn't put stents in them and you couldn't do bypasses. And real briefly, Big Ed spent six months going around the United States trying to convince doctors like myself to operate on him and everybody turned him down. And he wound up in my clinic at Loma Linda six months into this program. And he had put himself on a diet and he had lost 45 pounds in six months. And he had gone to a health food store and he had bought this huge shopping bag full of supplements. And he was taking supplements. And he convinced me to get a new angiogram, a cardiac catheterization, to see if he had done anything. Because I said, hey, you wasted your time and money. And this guy cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his coronary arteries in six months' time with a change in diet and taking stuff, supplements. And I'd been taught, all doctors are taught that that's impossible. Mm -hmm. And so I could have just you know, said, ah, you know, that's a fluke, it had nothing to do with anything, but I'm a researcher and I've been a researcher all my life. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm gonna find out you know, what he did. And I'm gonna start with myself. And then I'm going to teach the patients that I operated on how to avoid me in the future by changing their diet and taking supplements. And then after about a year of this uh, at Loma Linda, seeing the results on myself and on my patients, I said, you know, I'm, I'm making a horrible mistake. Um, I shouldn't operate on people and then teach them how to eat. I should teach them how to eat first and then I won't have to operate on them in the first place. Now, as a heart surgeon, that's really dumb. That's a, it's a really dumb career move, as my wife constantly reminds me. <laughs> Be, because even in academic medicine, you can make a whole lot more money as a heart surgeon than teaching people how to eat. You know, nobody yeah, wants to. So, yeah, so, you know, and so I, you know, resigned my position um, at kind of the height of my surgical career to start teaching people how to eat. And I've done, I've done that now for 20 years, and I still see pay day. I see patients Saturdays and Sundays, and people go, well, why do that? You know, you're a famous writer, you're, you know, famous uh, supplement company. You don't need to do that anymore. Well, I do. Uh, number one, I'm still a kid in a candy store. Um, I, I still like to see a 45-year-old woman, you know, regain control of, of her health with... You're talking about me? <laughs> and you, exactly. 45-year-old woman. Exactly. So it, it's, it's... And I learn so much uh, from my patients uh, asking me a question that I can't answer. And or showing me by, you know, here, I want, I want you to go to the health food store and I want you to buy this supplement and I want you to take it and I want to measure some parameters in your blood. I've gotten so good, I know when somebody has changed brands of a supplement, you can see it in their blood. And I used to think, you know, supplements made expensive urine. Um, they don't. No, that's fantastic. And, you know, I've been watching a lot of your uh, video podcasts on YouTube because you, you produce a lot. I actually don't understand where you get all your time from. But if you stand up 4.20 in the morning and go to bed at 8, maybe, maybe I can understand. Maybe I should uh, to follow, follow your path. But still, you have so much information to share and you do it in splendid ways 
and uh, uh, you, you, I heard that you actually tell people to get dogs. I assumed that was to get out of the house and go into the forest and have, you know, walks with your dogs and stuff. But it's also in order to exchange those bacteria. So we learned so much new information from you. So I just want to ask you to keep on doing this as long as you find it uh, uh, fun and uh, and share your curiosity. Well, yeah, I have no, I have no, I have no plans to retire because I again I know too much that retirement is the, the beginning of the end. Uh, and we have a saying in our clinic that 150 is the new 100. So. Uh, 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 so you'll see me around at 150 if if everything works out as the way I plan. That is. <laughs> that is fantastic. I was going to ask you about a life motto. If there is any like rule of life that you live by, maybe that's uh, um, 50, uh, 50 is the new hundred, or uh, is that yeah, 150 is the new 100. 150 is the new 100. Well, uh, again, uh, I can't say this enough. Um, you know my my dog get up every day excited uh, about the day. There's not one day that, that you know, that geez, you know, another day. Uh, I, I am so not looking forward to getting up. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's a celebration to get up. And if, if, if we could learn, you know, from animals, um, what we've lost because our brains think too much, our, you know, our monkey minds, um, you know, get up and say, man, I got another, I got another day. Uh, you know, some of my old patients say another day above ground, you know, beats anything else. <laughs> and, and, you know, and if, if it's got up and say, another day above ground, you know, what better gift? And, you know, what am I going to do with this? Mm. That is so true. Thank you so much, Dr. Gundry. Thank you for giving us your time this morning. Well, thank, thank so, you. Uh, and uh, hope, hope I'll be back in Sweden again. Definitely. And it, when that happens, we will all meet you from Lips Energy. Great, great. Have a wonderful day over there. Thank and you. And keep evening here and uh don't get too cold too soon okay <laughs> definitely not bye bye bye